Good morning and welcome to Fairlawn Avenue United Church on this autumn equinox Sunday in September as we seek out hints and whispers and traces of God's Spirit alive and engaged in our lives and in the world. It's good to have you here. As we've moved indoors to the chapel now, that now that mornings are a bit crisp, we're always already every day in the presence of God. In our worship, we bring attention and awareness to that presence. I have been struck this week by words from the poet Mary Oliver's poem, When I Am Among the Trees. Part of it reads like this. I am so distant from the hope of myself in which I have goodness and discernment, and never hurry through the world, but walk slowly and bow often. Around me the trees stir in their leaves and call out, stay a while. The light flows from their branches, and they call again. It's simple, they say, and you too have come into the world to do this to go easy, to be filled with light, and to shine. Eleanor Daly has provided us with a music service alongside this recorded portion of worship with music clips that continue to express just how important music is in our worship at Fairlawn. So scroll down below this video for the link. Believe me, your worship will not be complete until that's a part of it too. Here are some words to gather us together into worship this day. Creator God, we come together to share in a common spiritual journey and yearning, to find words that express our search for meaning, to find partners with whom we can work to make a difference in the world, and most of all, we come to settle into your loving presence that is personal embrace. In you and here with others, we discover what life can be, relentlessly loving, abundantly forgiving, and radically free. Thank you for offering such life to us again and then again and again. Thank you for removing barriers and opening doors for re reawakening hopes and dreams. Give us clear vision, enduring values, and enough love and courage to put our faith into practice through all the common scenes of life. Amen. Our reader this morning is Chris Leonard. The parable of the laborers in the vineyard is unique to the Gospel of Matthew. It is a true-to-life parable. Day laborers would be readily available in the marketplace, but it would be unusual for a wealthy landowner to personally source his own workers. Usually, the manager would have hired the laborers and would have been responsible to pay wages. More than likely, the manager would have returned to the marketplace to hire additional workers at the end of the day, offering the same wage. He would be fearful of his landowner's reaction to such an unwise investment in labor. The worker's complaint seems reasonable. Why wouldn't those who have labored less receive less? But the landowner has a different conception of fairness. And could choose to do what he pleased with his resources. 
the parable of the laborers in the vineyard might more aptly be called the parable of the landowner's generosity. Our reading is from Matthew 20, verses 1 to 16. The kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. After he agreed with the workers to pay them a denarian, he sent them into his vineyard. Then he went out around nine in the morning and saw others standing around the marketplace doing nothing. He said to them, You also go into the vineyard and I'll pay you whatever is right. And they went. Again around noon and then at three in the afternoon he did the same thing. Around five in the afternoon, he went and found others standing around. And he said to them, Why are you just standing around and doing nothing all day long? Because nobody has hired us, they replied. He responded, You also go into the vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, Call the workers and give them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and moving on finally to the first. When those who were hired at five in the afternoon came, each one received a denarian. Now when those hired first came, they thought they would receive more but each of them also received a denarian. When they received it, they grumbled against the landowner. These who were hired last worked one hour, and they received the same pay as we did, even though we had to work the whole day in the hot sun. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I did you no wrong. Didn't I agree to pay you a denarian? Take what belongs to you and go. I want to give to this one who was hired last the same as I give to you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with what belongs to me? Or are you resentful because I am generous? So those who are last will be first, and those who are first will be last. In this reading, we hear God's voice. God is still speaking. Thanks be to God. Jesus' parables, simple, folksy, stories with a punch, are many people's most familiar and favorite parts of the New Testament with their relatable characters and ancient wisdom. The parable of the Good Samaritan, for example, challenges us but leaves us with a good feeling at the end. The stranger that everyone is supposed to jeer at ends up being the hero. And the parable of the prodigal son, where the ne'er-do-well son takes his inheritance and goes off to squander every penny, but when he comes home to grovel, Surprise! He's joyfully welcomed back. A story about second chances. But not many people like the parable that Chris read this morning. It doesn't impart a nice, warm feeling at the end. There are no characters that really win our heart. And there's no sense of justice or fairness that people get what they deserve. In fact, quite the opposite. Perhaps more than just about any other parable that Jesus tells, this one of the workers in the vineyard disrupts our sense of things, of balance, of what's right and fair and equal. Jesus undermines the very Protestant work ethic that later capitalist economies would come to depend upon. So what are we to do? 
Well, what we can always do when trying to penetrate the meaning of biblical texts. Listen for the questions. Listen for the questions. And Jesus asks an awkward question through the landowner in the story. Are you resentful? Are you envious because I am generous? Mary Gordon, in her book, Reading Jesus, a writer's encounter with the Gospels, calls this an impossible question, calling for an impossible honesty. Because yes, she writes, I am envious because you are generous. I'm envious because my work has not been rewarded. I'm envious because someone got away with something. Envy has eaten my heart. I appreciate Gordon's candor, because really, if this parable doesn't provoke us at least a little bit, then we're not paying attention. After all, we know how the world is supposed to work. Time is money, and fair is fair. Equal pay for equal work is fair. Equal pay for unequal work is not fair. Technology startups can turn early investors into millionaires, and why shouldn't they? Surely those who took the biggest risks and worked the hardest in the beginning deserve to reap the greatest rewards. The early bird gets the worm, and all that. It's only fair. But God, if the landowner in this parable represents God, to which I would say, sort of, but let's not push the analogy. But God is not fair, not according to our assumptions about fairness. God, it turns out, does not believe that the best place to be is at the front of the line. God is not interested, unlike most of us, in showing favor to the best, the biggest, and the brightest, or even the hardest working. God is not obsessed with who deserves what. In fact, the landowner doesn't even ask why some workers were able to start at dawn and others were not. All that God is concerned with is making sure that every last person gets a place in this vineyard. The early bird and the latecomer, the able-bodied and the infirm, the young and the old, the popular and the forgotten. Why did some laborers end up unemployed until 5 p.m.? The parable is clear, because no one would hire them. Perhaps they weren't as healthy or as skilled as their competition. Whatever the case may be, the landowner doesn't ask them to defend themselves. He just makes sure that every worker ends the day with dignity and the security of a living wage, the capacity to go home that night and feed his family. Are you envious because I am generous? The workers who got more than they expected, the ones who received more pay than they thought they deserved, what they experienced that day was pure gift, blessing, and it was probably not something that had happened often or ever in their life. As for the envy, bitterness, grumbling, and resentment, those belong to the deserving folks at the front of the line. Though the landowner had honored his agreement with them, Though they had received their daily reward, their daily bread, and they lacked, they lacked no good thing, they spent their off hours consumed with frustration and anger. Of course, it's telling that the landowner insists on pay, paying the workers in reverse order to make sure that the first workers saw what the last received. It would have been much easier to pay the all-day laborers first, sending them home 
before they could see what their less deserving counterparts received. But no, the landowner wanted them to see what kind of vineyard he ran. He wanted them to experience radical generosity. Are you right to be angry? Are you envious because God is generous? Listen for the questions. And the questions become even more acute when set in the context of today's globalized economy. Amy Jill Levine, who is somewhat uniquely a practicing Orthodox Jew, a feminist, and a New Testament scholar, points out in her book, Short Stories by Jesus, the enigmatic parables of a controversial rabbi, that, quote, Jesus was more interested in how we love our neighbor than how we get into heaven. So, this parable, she suggests, is meant to be about real workers in a real marketplace and real landowners who hire those workers. Wasn't Jesus the kind of guy who wanted everyone to have enough? Amy Jo Levine said, asks. If, the, if those who were hired late through no fault of their own only got one-tenth of a day's wage, their families would starve. This is the same Jesus who told a rich man to sell everything, who directed party hosts to invite those who couldn't invite them in return, who spoke of lenders for giving massive financial debts, and who included despised and untouchable people in his inner circle. Sure, shares of stock in any company run by Jesus would plummet in value. And maybe we can't pull off the vineyard wage maneuver in our economy. But is there a way to lean in that direction, to engage in something dramatic, to veer a bit more towards Jesus than business as usual? The economies and the economics that we encounter in the Bible involves God providing enough for our daily needs. Give us this day our daily bread. God's economics is based on creation's abundance and each person's need, which is seen as legitimate and as something that all people share in common. It is an approach that is distorted by privatization of supply for our daily needs, commodification leading to price fluctuations, the drive to endless growth and the creation of imagined needs for which products are then marketed. God's economics are based on interdependence, generosity, and abundance, not the fear of scarcity, accumulation, resource, and labor exploitation, and the movement of capital and wealth in ways that increase inequality, the things that drive our economy. In our pandemic-challenged world, we are now seeing its stark, unequal economic impact alongside the continuing climate change crisis and the anger and acts of resistance of oppressed groups, blacks and indigenous people, women, agricultural laborers, migrant workers, and young people stuck in a gig economy. Suddenly, people are talking about God's economics, vineyard economics, with serious intent. Only it's called a universal basic income, or as the United Church prefers, a guaranteed livable income. No one is disadvantaged by the fact that everyone, at least, is insured to get enough. No one loses out in order that nobody be left behind. But Jesus' story is also about entitlement. 
a little earlier in Matthew, the disciples were overheard by Jesus arguing amongst each other over who will be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, who will have been deemed the most worthy when Jesus is in power. So it's no surprise that this parable is not addressed to the larger crowds, but only to Jesus' inner circle. Because the point of the parable is not just about how generous God is, but also about how envious, self-serving, and entitled the disciples are inclined to be. It's a rebuke to their quid pro quo attitude at times. What do we get in return for following you and giving up all kinds of things in life? The thing is, like Peter, we feel entitled to fairness, too, as we understand it. If there's one thing we're all born with from childhood, when the pieces of birthday cake are being handed out, it's an innate sense of fairness. And it's a powerful thing, because that sense of fairness developed into maturity is the basis for justice and equality. And so we have learned with time that it's not fair that some can vote and others can't. That some ride in the front of the bus while others stay in the back. That some are paid more for the same work. That some go to bed hungry while others fill landfills with their excess. But we tend to assess fairness in terms of what seems fair not only to us, but also for us. We measure fairness over against our own wants, needs, hopes, and expectations, with a lesser regard for the wants and needs of others. Some would say it's just human nature, that through our own lack of trust, because of a gnawing sense of insecurity, we define ourselves over against others, comparing and resenting what they have. We appraise our lives, not by the abundance we've been given, but by what we still lack. The parable of the laborers in the vineyard does exactly what Jesus' parables are meant to do, which is to make us uncomfortable to think twice. The subversive point in this parable is to make us realize how deep our sense of entitlement is and what it would require of us to let go of that spiritually, emotionally, and economically. Jesus' folksy little story illustrates a great reversal of privilege and of fairness, where the first become last and the last become first, as we tend to measure these things, which simply means that we all end up with enough. Some may well end up with more, even a lot more, but everyone has enough. There's a Haitian proverb, God gives, but God doesn't share, which means that God has given us enough and more than enough of everything we need. It's up to us to share. Migrant workers, farm laborers, still today in southwestern Ontario, are vulnerable and at a disadvantage. I'm angry, said the United Farm Workers, Cesar Chavez, that I live in a world where a man who picks food for a living can't afford to feed his own family. This parable is not a blueprint for labor practices or for economic systems any more than the parable of the prodigal son is a class on parenting. 
Any company that paid people who work one hour a day the same as it paid full-time workers would soon have a hard time finding employees willing to show up early. Even so, this parable works on our imaginations in ways that have profound implications for our sense of the market and of economic justice. It allows us to enter for a moment into an alternate world that operates on generosity rather than greed, ambition, and competition. It allows us to experience a world in which those who stand ignored and discarded by society are nevertheless of great value to God and deserve to live with dignity each day. After letting our imaginations dwell in the unearned generosity of God, we can no longer look at those advocating for a universal basic income or a guaranteed livable income and say that it just encourages laziness. We know that God cares about justice, and justice does make things better. But it's love that takes justice a step further to transform situations and people. In Jesus, God opts for love, generosity, and grace that sets aside the rules and calculations of fairness alone. Rankings themselves are pushed aside. Last, first, first, last. In this vineyard, no one is last. As Harold Kushner, the author of Why Do Bad Things Happen to Good People, puts it, do things for people not because of who they are, or what they do in return, but because of who you are. Amen. We are joined once again today by one of our choristers, Doug McNaughton. Hi everybody, Doug McNaughton here. This is a piece called Lord of the Starfields. Lord of the Starfields Ancient of Day Universe Maker, here's a song in your praise. Wings of the storm cloud, beginning and end, you make my heart. Like a banner in the wind Oh, love that fires the sun Keep me burning Oh, love that fires the sun Keep me of the Nova 
smile of the Jew. All of our yearning only comes home to you. Oh, love that fires the sun, keep me burning. Oh, love that fires the sun, keep me burning. We're working hard to adapt Fairlawn's life and ministry to the shifting impact of the ongoing pandemic crisis. And now, as we move into the fall, we're inviting you to a chance to check in, to hear how everyone is doing, to join our virtual Welcome Back Barbecue. If you have thoughts or questions about how we're doing church now and going forward, this is the opportunity to share those questions with members of Governing Council who will be part of the discussion and will answer questions as best they can. I will have my grill apron on and have the barbecue fired up and I'll do my best to facilitate the discussion while flipping hot dogs and hamburgers. We are eager to hear what's on your hearts and minds. So that is following the service today at 11.15 a.m. and I hope you will join us. The link to Zoom was sent with the invitation to this online worship service and was also in greetings this week. As always, please let us know if you or someone you are aware of has need for someone to call to check in or to help out to provide assistance. An email to me or to the church office or a call to someone who can do that for you will work well to ensure that someone gets back to you promptly. Now let us bring the thoughts and concerns, the hopes of our hearts and minds and spirits together in prayer. God, Spirit, who vibrates with life in and around and through us, in prayer, we ease ourselves into your presentness, seeking strength, seeking peace, seeking direction. Settle us into you, enlarge our love, and sharpen our vision so that we might be transformed, renewed in prayer, opened to your life at work in our lives. The first shall be last, and the last shall be first, and your way in the world is a different way, a way to a place where love and justice embrace, and where we dance with joy together and discover that the world can be a better place for all its peoples. Choosing to side with your hope-filled life, we pray with eyes wide open, we pray for and with those who dwell on the margins of our economy, who suffer the pain and anxiety that comes with minimal income or financial insecurity. God of challenge and change, the stories Jesus told show us how great the gap can sometimes be between divine and human economies. Forgive us when we let attachment to our own comfort and convenience deter us from committing the costly transitions necessary for the well-being of our planet and the flourishing of all its inhabitants. We pray as your church and for the church. Challenge us with the work of reimagining your ministry that we may once again know your unmistakable presence in our midst, surprising us in all that we do as we do new things together with joy in your name for the life of the world. 
We pray for those who are working together to provide the leadership we need as a congregation at this time, that they may know themselves to be grounded and surrounded by our support, prayers, trust, and appreciation. And may we together be open to what you are calling us to do and to be a part of this new thing you are doing in our midst. Great lover of humanity, we pray for our families and our friends, for those we see each day and those we have not seen for a long time. We remember before you the sick and the tired, the brokenhearted and those who grieve, families who are feeling overwhelmed, children returning to school. God, who hears the still small voice, Listen now as we offer you our prayers in silence and in the quiet of our hearts. Holy One, you walk with us. You make a way for us, and you free us from indifference, from apathy, from fear. In your love for us and for the world, come among us breathing calm, opening new horizons and leading us through. We pray in the name of Jesus, whose words and whose way fills the world with life. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I hope you took a, t a moment took some time to read in this week's greetings about the Reverend Jean Ward, who is joining us this fall as a guest minister one Sunday a month, beginning next Sunday, September 27th. Jean and I have worked together over the years and we're both excited by the opportunity for collaboration as we all adapt to creative new ways of doing and being church. I will continue to lead worship and preach, to provide guidance to staff and lay leaders as we work to discern meaning from community outreach and this whole pandemic experience, and of course, to provide pastoral support to all fair honors. Jean retired not long ago and was looking for somewhere to contribute her knowledge and experience in innovative ways. And Fairlawn seemed like just the thing. So this week, Jean and I had a chat on Zoom, and we thought that maybe you'd like to sit in on a bit of that. So hi, Jean. I'm going to hope that everybody who's uh, listening into our chat is, uh, has had an opportunity to read the brief introduction to you and greetings where they'll learn about your maritime roots and your very diverse path through ministry which is something that you and I kind of share but I'm wondering I mean I love the Fairlawn family the Fairlawn congregation but a lot of people count down the months and days to retirement and so I'm was wondering because you've been so busy in retirement what caught your interest or attention when we got in touch with you to talk about doing some work with us? Well, first of all, I know a bit about Fairlawn because of my work with you through, um, through the, the work that we've been doing um, in the cluster. And so I already, I already had some connection. I'd met some of the lay people. And, uh, and so I was intrigued by the invite. Plus, I haven't been working in a church since the end of June, and I hadn't realized after two months that I actually mm, sort of wanted to be doing something again. 
and the Fairlawn, your experience there, what you're doing sounds so exciting. To be a part of that for a little bit would be wonderful. We're doing some really interesting things, even with the pandemic. And uh, I know that many of us are in churches today are painfully aware of all the things that we can't do anymore, like hug each other and get together in person and so much else. But we're, we're gradually getting a sense of what we can do that we couldn't do as easily before in diversifying how we express our faith, how we make community happen. And I'm, because of so much that's been lost, I hesitate to call it silver linings, but I do sense that we're discovering that there are things that we can do, like looping you in from the West End and diversifying our worship and bring people together for small group discussions and that sort of thing. And I'm, I'm wondering how you're seeing that, because neither you nor I, when we went to seminary all those years ago, uh, had any training in any of this sort of stuff. It's all new. None whatsoever. Sense of possibility <laughs> there. <laughs> There's lots of possibility. Once we all got over the shock of the pandemic and what that was forcing us to do, and the shock of doing online worship, and horrors, the shock of trying to think about how we might even expand that into some small group ministry and discussions and stuff. Once we got over that shock, I, for one, and I, and I know you because I've talked with you about this as well, and there are many of us who are saying the same things, we are surprised by how it's opened up opportunities for us. It doesn't take away all of the kind of uneasiness with the change and not knowing what's happening, but the ability to be online through Zoom or however we're doing it and to be in connection with one another has actually opened it up rather than closed it in. And it, I find that just challenging but really exciting. I do too. I think I've just been talking with some of the leaders on governing council about some of the opportunities that are opening up when we uh, begin to look at, at uh, what we can do now. And uh, it's, it's a different kind of perspective. Mm -hmm. Also, this, this week, for example, uh, Noel Boat and our communication staff person began a fall spirituality small group series called Embrace Your Gifts began with a quick test of each participant's spiritual type. Are you a lover, a sage, a prophet, or a mystic? I took the test, but I'm not going to tell you which one I am. Um, but uh, I'm aware that as we work to understand and adapt to these really strange times, that we need insights from all kinds of different perspectives and, and experiences, especially when they're able to be in sync, as I think you and I are. So I don't really remember uh, being on such a dramatic learning curve before in ministry. This is uh, really interesting uh, after 30 some years, but uh, it's a really, really opening up emotional and spiritual depths I'm finding in myself and in members of the congregation. I, I asked some people in the congregation what they wanted me to ask you, because I said we'd be having this, this uh, taping this dialogue, and I said, so what do you want me to ask Jean? And they said, ask Jean what brings her hope and or joy in these times? So there you go. There's the question. What brings you hope or, and or joy in these times? There, there's a lot of um, uh, there's a lot of things that cause anxiety, and I think we send, we tend to sort of uh, concentrate on that. Yeah. But the reality is, is I think all of us have experienced another way of being with each other. One of the things that gives me um, a great sort of joy and anticipation for the future is the fact that somehow in this time through the pandemic and everything that's happening, as we've been chatting online together, um, there's been like an opening up of the door to a wider and more diverse group of people to be talking together. Have you noticed that? That, yeah. that yeah. we have some voices around the table we've never had before. 
That's right. And so, and so there's this sense that people are really craving the chance to talk together honestly and to be able to challenge one another, but also to learn from one another. And I just think that has such tremendous possibility for us as the people of, of, um, of the church and an opening out into the world and so that we're talking together and not these small groups. I've heard a number of people at Fairlawn who, in the midst of a, a conversation that opened up all kinds of really rich discussion, have sort of said, you know, if we bump into each other before in the hallway at the church, we would never have talked about these things. This is really interesting. And it, it has, I think, really pushed us to some really authentic and deep conversations about things. And I know it's pushed me in ministry to be even more excited than ever to reach out to collegiality and to, to the kind of things that I know you'll bring to Fairlawn because I, I mean, I'm aware of the things that I can do reasonably effectively. And I'm also aware of all the things that I'm really not good at. And I think would really strengthen our uh, ministry and our mission at, uh, at Fairlawn in these days. So Welcome, Jean. I'm really looking forward to working together again and uh, seeing where this journey goes. I know that the people of Fairlawn will get to know you through less than ideal means sometimes, uh, electronically, but they'll figure out, I think, for themselves pretty quickly why I'm so excited that you're coming on board. You'll be leading worship for the first time next Sunday, September 27th, and then you'll We'll, we will both be joining the coffee chat and uh, following the service. And in fact, if all goes well with your end of summer cottage trip this weekend, you'll join us by phone on our welcome back barbecue coffee chat and congregational check-in by phone this Sunday. So we'll see if that works out, but welcome. It's good to Thank have you. Thank you so much. I'm looking forward to it. Wonderful. After the service, our coffee hour chat this week and next will become a virtual welcome back barbecue, as I mentioned earlier, online using Zoom. The details for connecting were in greetings this week and were included in the notice that you received this morning for this worship service. I hope you can join us. And now as we conclude this time together, let's bless one another. On this day, the blessings of heaven. On this day, the blessings of earth. On this day, the blessings of sea and of sky. To open us to life, to ground us in life, to fill us with life, with wonder and with love. Go in peace. Amen.